Hey, everyone. Jim Roos from the Financial Brand, the Banking Transform podcast. I am really excited about today's talk in our webinar because we're talking to Galileo and David Foyer, who I've known for years. And it's, it's very interesting because we're talking about core conversions. Core conversions is like poison to financial institutions. It, they want to stay away from it. They, it's kind of like a no, no tread zone. But it's on the tip of everybody's discussion as to what is important to actually digitally modernize your organization. So while you'd love to avoid it forever, I think everybody knows we've got it, bite the bullet and do it. Now, the good news is, compared to what this world was five years ago, even that recently, it is a whole different playing field right now. You have the ability to convert your core in ways never thought possible before and with a whole lot less stress and anxiety. Now, it's not the easiest process in the world, but it's important. And, and as we all know, and I say it in many of my events, change sucks, but it's all good for you. So as I mentioned, I have David Foyer with us from Galileo. Okay, David, before we start, can you give a little bit of background into your background and where you've come from? But and then we'll get into the conversation around uh, conversion of the core. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Dave Foyer, I've been the chief product officer at Galileo for about 20 months now. Uh, before that, I actually worked at Google. I was the head of product management for Apigee, which is the API management platform at Google. Uh, and I also had built Google's payment gateway, uh, focused on open banking ecosystems uh, such as UPI. So uh, got to know uh, Derek White, who's our CEO at Google. We worked together there. And uh, you know, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed working for him ever since. So, you know, let's let's start at the beginning. You know, I mentioned to me at the beginning how how stressful it is to think about converting your core, but the reality is most financial institutions, I'd, I'd actually say around 80% of them have basically legacy systems working in the background. And as Derek likes to say, you know, we've got to convert behind the glass in order to have the top of the glass actually work, to have the ability to say, this thing looks and feels the way it should. We've been doing it in all kinds of ways, but every time we try to modernize the front facing elements at, without modernizing the back office, we're going to be in, in a difficult situation because we're just cobblestoning it together. So, you know, we have a lot of legacy banking architectures out there and they remain stagnant. How do and how is the modern core architecture today helping banks evolve in, in, to the needs of what's needed for not only a digital first customer, but a digital first organization? Yeah, so uh, I think we need to start with our systems really the problem, and and I want to I want to shift that because systems both are and are not the problem, and by that I mean the ultimate problem that I think banks need to focus on and banks recognize that they need to fix is the digital divide, which is to say, how do I take my monolithic legacy infrastructure? and orient it such that I can meet customer demand at the speed that customers are expecting it. And I think that's a huge challenge. I think, uh, you know, the Cornerstone Advisors last year had this had this uh, study that talked about, you know, 47% of all new checking accounts were captured by fintechs. That's almost half of all new checking accounts. And that tells me that fintechs and the neobanks are doing a better job of addressing customer demands and customer expectations around onboarding and signing up for accounts and the digital experience uh, than, than, the legacy, than, the, than the legacy banks who have been doing this for much longer. And so that tells me that there's a digital divide to be addressed. And for a long time, we tried to address that divide through a whole bunch of different systems, you know, two-speed IT, and we can certainly talk, talk about that. At the end of the day, I think what it comes down to is that neobanks and fintechs have the opportunity of new, fresh infrastructure and architecture that's been built in a cloud-native manner. It's not monolithic. It's not uh, It's not based on sort of legacy end-tier architecture principles, but it's based on more modern principles that we can talk about, such as mock, you know, microservices, uh, uh, APIs, and, and headless and the like. So I think uh, when it comes down to it, the question is, as a large financial uh, institution today, is your infrastructure holding you back? And if it is, how do you better focus on meeting customer needs so that indeed customers turn to uh, legacy financial institutions and not just to neobanks and fintechs to get the digital uh, experiences that they expect? So David, it's interesting because 
as I mentioned I, before we even got on the uh, line today, is that you know, you know, it's not a bank out there, a credit union out there that doesn't know they need to modernize their core system. They know that that's good for them. They know they need to do it. They may even have it on their planning calendar. You're on the field quite a bit. What is it that holds organizations back from doing what's good for them? Is it money? Is it time? Is it culture? Is it a combination? What do you, what do you see as the primary reason why people go, gosh, yes, we have to do it? Uh, not today. Yeah. So I definitely think it's all the above, but I think all that's inter intertwined. And I think in order to really understand it, we'd sort of have to look at, at at sort of the history of how a lot of this evolved, right? What ended up happening was, you know, there's sort of this core banking uh, architecture that looks a lot like it did in the 1960s, right? I think that the racks are shinier, the disks are faster, but there's still these like refrigerator style hardware things running somewhere, right? And, and that style of engineering died a long time ago, I think like, like the early 2000s, right? So we've since evolved into new ways of quickly building and deploying applications, but financial services has struggled to keep up with that paradigm. So like as a retailer today, right? If I want returns or inventory refresh, I used to need to buy these modules in order to enable that functionality, right? I had to I had this heavy legacy ERP system and it took many months to upgrade, but like retails moves past that. And if I want returns today, I've got a bunch of options, right? There's all, obviously the, you know, Shopify commerce tools, big commerce, that whole world. And then of course there's the API providers that have API products that do this. And I can simply in a very headless way integrate with those API providers. So that's, that's sort of the mode modern cloud-based developers are expecting to, to build in, right? But if you look at banking cores, like the Gen 1 and Gen 2 providers, they still operate in that ERP mode. It's like, if you want checking, that's a module. You want savings and CDs, that's a module. You want lending, you want escrow, those are all modules. And by the way, each one comes with a hefty price and a hefty integration effort. And so I think Conway's law helped make those modules into different silos. So now we have different teams across payments and deposits and loans that kind of own those different modules, right? Uh, and that further creates challenges working together and sort of creating an omni-channel approach that looks across all of the data and the entire total customer experience to say, hey, here's what we want to provide to this customer and here are the journeys and the, and the friction that we're trying to solve. So I think what's really holding back banks is a mix of all the above. It's organizational structure that's a direct reflection of sort of the way the legacy cores used to work. And of course, the fact that many of these banks have 40 or 50 years of applications running in front of these legacy cores uh, that they would need to modify in order to move to a new core in a big bang faction. And I think that's a probably the biggest misconception I see in the industry when I talk to banks about core migration and core modernization is that, you know, there are other ways to do this. You don't have to do a big bang migration and you don't really have to think about things in terms of infrastructure. You can focus on customers and customer problems and really build an iterative approach that helps you create business achievements that are in line with sort of the business spend and the TCO of the investments you're making so that uh, so that this is not an infrastructure project. Rather, this is a very customer-focused business enabler. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest challenge is that banks say, okay, I have to replace all of this with all of that, as opposed to saying, what are the customer problems that I struggle to solve today? What are the pieces that I need in order to solve that? And can I get another provider for that? The fact that it's a core provider is sort of irrelevant, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting because you talk about the the cost and the culture and just the scope of a core conversion. You just addressed a little bit of what can be done when you you break these things apart. But let's break into the cost first. You know, it's interesting because a lot of organizations go, you know, economic uncertainty right now. We have a lot of things going on. The cost of a conversion is going to be overwhelming, but. Can you explain that that basically the cost of a legacy system is much more costly than the cost of an upgrade? Yeah, you know, I think there's there's a few points there that are important, right? I think the first is that uh, the you know we try to solve. Actually, let me take a different approach. We know, right, that that running banks running on outdated cores estimate. I think it's somewhere like. 10 times or more are 10 times yep. more expensive than those running on modern cloud-based banking cores. And I think that gets expressed in multiple ways. It gets expressed in the time it takes to deploy new products. There's a whole cost benefit analysis around not being able to 
uh, ship certain products because it costs so much to launch a product in that iterative nature. And then of course, the inability for those monolithic systems to be able to capture, directly capture market demand. So the ability for, uh, let's say to do iterative CI, CD, you know, the continuous integration, uh, cloud-based manner of development that would normally see new iterative application uh, improvements on let's say a bi-weekly basis, that becomes a three month to six month turnaround because it, you know, new, new core release, New heavy application releases with middleware require much more stringent Q and A processes, and sort of um, you know all of the challenges around monolithic systems hold back uh, development cadence, which means that the bank misses misses market opportunity. It misses the ability to catch capture customers at key moments in their journeys because those journeys evolve, and 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 frankly, it, it just. Uh, the, the TCO ends up being much higher, both from an infrastructure perspective and from a cost benefit analysis perspective. So what happens is the cost of operating, administering and maintaining infrastructure is arduous, is, is very high. And then the cost of missing those business opportunities is also very high. Those conspire together to create an extremely expensive environment to operate in. And like we know the, the cloud, and, and by the way, there's all kinds of secondary effects that are worth thinking about in terms of, you know, talent acquisition and retention. It's it's hard to hire COBOL programmers today, but uh, but every every computer science certainly graduate, certainly I can get many in the Gen Z or the you know, the Gen X generation. You're, you're not going exactly. to find that COBOL there. Exactly, but every Gen every Gen Z you know computer science graduate certainly knows about modern cloud development practices and ML and and these sort of more modern. Uh, more modern technologies that help focus on customer and the customer experiences. So all these channel, all these challenges around an omni-channel approach, a data-centric approach, a customer-centric approach, and creating an environment where developers really thrive, uh, they all conspire together with the cost of running that infrastructure to miss business opportunities and cost banks untold amounts of dollars. Well, I you know I I go back decades in banking and changing a core was always the thing that everybody would always talk about, but also be fearful of, because you'd almost have to shut down the bank for a number of years to be able to do it. In fact, I still know some banks right now that are going through core conversions for the last 10 to 12 years, which is insane. That you, you mentioned it, that's no longer necessary. You don't have to do it all at the same time. And you don't have to set aside everything you're doing currently to convert the whole core. You know, now more than ever, you have the ability to embrace composable banking solutions that not only embrace, like, let's say, a digital banking platform, but the core itself. What kind of capabilities, what power is that brought to the industry where, you know, if you want to convert to your platform, for instance, I can say, here's my primary challenge I have that I want to address with my consumers. How do I take care of that part of my core? Yeah, so so I think that ends up looking a lot like uh, you know we basically have two models of of core augmentation, which is to say, not a big bang core replacement uh, that we tend to see quite frequently, right? Because uh, the recommendation that we have is focus on the customer problem, let us help you solve that customer problem and launch a new business, and not focus as much on the infrastructure. Of course, we can, and we're involved in a number of core migration efforts, but I think. Uh, I do think that that's challenging for banks for all the reasons that you just mentioned. So like figuring out what are the sorts of ways we can help a customer launch an independent product line. And sometimes that's a new product or a new digital subsidiary, right? The, the sort of the sidecar, the side-by-side -side method, um, that's super fun. And, and, it, and it's really actually uh, quite enjoyable. And I think it all comes down to, to basically four technologies, which are mock, right? If you are microservices based, if you are, if you have a strong API layer, if you are cloud-based and you support headless, I think, which, you know, the, the M-A-C-H of mock is microservices, API, cloud, and headless. I think helping banks build applications in a composable and agile way requires those technologies. And those are sort of the four key themes that make up a Gen 3 core. I think if you have those themes, you're able to create a unique environment. And I think if we think about the digital maturity gap, and we talked a little bit about talent acquisition, acquisition and sort of the challenges in, in building um, in building what the next generation of your bank has to look like, right? And it's not just, the, of, of course, the run the bank, which is sort of the infrastructure cost. It's the build the bank. It's the new products and introducing new products. 
I think it really comes down to two things. The first is creating an environment for bank developers where they're thriving, right? So that's like modern computing paradigms like microservices, the APIs for composability, which is, you know, you mentioned composition journeys. Like when we had to build BNPL, uh, our buy now pay later product, we leveraged Galileo's core, which, which we used to call Cyberbank core. And that did the interest calculations to set up the account. We exposed the API using Galileo's developer portal for API products, and then we, we launched it, right? Uh, after that, we were able to quickly iterate. So we had SMB BNPL and post-purchase BNPL and card to loan and the like, because like we had a clean architecture and it was all in the cloud and we, we could just simply incrementally build and deliver new and related services. And so that mode of development is a mode where developers thrive and they can quickly test, deploy, increment, et cetera. So I think that's super important. I think the other one is, is this sort of this, this, the albatross of infrastructure, right? So talking to CIOs and CTOs, I think uh, a lot of the time that they spend working on the business is really working on infrastructure and integration. And it's not as much about customers and what the business needs to be successful. So you know, what we tend to recommend is sort of, you know, build an environment where your team can focus on the challenges that are core to customer centric banking and the customers will follow. And by doing that, you don't have to replace your core. You can augment your core side by side, launch a new type of CD, launch a new product like BNPL, launch what, whatever it is, right? Focus on the customer. And that helps really bridge that digital divide because you can then focus on shipping at the speed the market expects and then migrate your infrastructure at the speed that makes sense, frankly, for your CFO and your, your market economics, as opposed to the big bank strategy, which is like, you're either running on one core or the other, right? Right, right. So, so, so David, let's say you're going into bank XYZ. You're going to be in charge of core conversion, okay? Let's assume, I'm going to say it's a typical finance institution. So whatever you want to consider typical. And let's figure that the organization does not have finances to, I call it rip and replace the old core for a brand new core, but they have to start somewhere. Where would probably be your place you'd start that allows the organization to, number one, build the foundation for learning what a new core is, what it means, the dynamics of it. Number two, will probably generate the best return on investment in the near term. And number three, will not not be an, a, an overall lengthy process. In other words, you want to introduce the organization to where they should start. You want to do it at a point where it's not going to take forever to get it. So they're going to get some speed involved there. And it's going to have a direct impact on the consumer and on the bottom line. What, what would you start? So, you know, the one thing I will say is that a lot of the time the banks want us to recommend where to start. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a funny conversation because I'm not that bank. I think that bank knows their business much better than I do. So the banks are going to know where their pain points are, what yeah. their customers demand, where there are gaps, where they're churning out customers to competitors, and for what reason. And so my 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 first recommendation would be, can we partner to look at what are the key areas of your business where you feel there are gaps? And those might actually be far outside of what you would traditionally think of banking core services. It might be things like real-time money movement, right? It may be things like pooled accounts. It may be things like new channels, right? Maybe that bank wants to become a sponsor bank uh, and they're currently really only focused on consumer retail banking, or maybe they want to enter SMB. So I think a lot of a lot of the work is really sort of figuring out where the biggest business problems are, because at the end of the day, the entire purpose of the technology is to focus on and support the business. And so I think there's we as technologists don't spend enough time saying, hey, what does the business need? What do the customers need? How can we get there? And so that's that's sort of where we start the conversation, right? That all being said, you know, we talked a little bit about the independently migrating product lines and that approach. And I certainly think that works, particularly when the products are missing uh, key features, uh, key functionality that customers need. And so they go elsewhere for that, right? And, and you know, kind of typical... Uh, if it takes 20 plus 30 minutes to sign up for a new account where in the neobanks, it takes you know two to five minutes, then uh, maybe we should talk about account onboarding and talk about how to do that in a more efficient way. Classic, so, you know. So David, let's, let's take that as an example because it's a great example because I was just in an event. I think every organization I met was saying, we, the thing we've got to do, we, we got to fix our new, new account onboarding, or the new account onboarding and the opening process. We got to, we got to move from 15 to three to five. So that being said, 
from a core perspective, because you want to get the core right before you try to build the experience, because it, you're going to be held back otherwise. How long have you seen organizations take to build the core that allows for a good modern account opening process and their deployment process? What's the time and what's the effort that's required? I would say it really depends on the organization, and it's hard for me to give you a number of months, and I'll tell you why. Different organizations have uh, different interaction mechanisms internally, and and uh, some of what I've seen in banks is is really sophisticated, complex, and elegant, uh, but but quite arduous to integrate with because there's multiple systems, right? There's a GL, there's an LMS, there's different businesses that need to be notified. Of course, there's all the regulatory stuff, uh, AML and this whole CY, this, the whole uh, C customer information program uh, and OFAC check and all of that, right? Uh, can be quite complex systems that require integration. And so the problem is actually not standing up the core. The problem there is integrating with those legacy systems. And so yep. uh, I, I find banks come back and say, well, should we replace those systems or not? And I think there's a, an analysis that has to occur there. And then, you know, so that that's one piece of the puzzle. And then the other piece of the puzzle is what exactly are you solving for in the onboarding experience that's taking so long? And can we identify that? And what I found is that banks actually don't know. It's really hard to figure that out because there's 200 things happening and there's interdependencies that were, were created years ago that no longer have to be there that might be there. And that actually has very little to do with the core, but the core can be a great venue by which you can re, you know, reassess those sort of BPO flows and say, hey, we can greatly simplify this process. So I've seen, you know, when we wanted to launch our, our you know, some of our services internally using uh, the core, we were able to do it extremely quickly, I'd say in less than two months. But that is uh, particularly unique because it's our core and we're intimately familiar with it. And I, I would never suggest to a bank that they could do any sort of core product uh, from scratch in two months. But I don't think this is a two year thing. I think you should expect to see value in a short period of time in a, in, in a time that's that's ma managed and monitored on a quarterly basis and not a yearly basis. And, and I think that's the probably the right resolution to get started. Get something small up and running, get experience with the core, get some value, and then see how you can iteratively, you know, iteratively increase the value proposition either in one product line or multiple product lines. And I don't think, by the way, it's just products, it's services as well, right? It might be real-time money movement. It might be channels. I know we yeah. talked in terms of products, but uh, from a bank perspective, it could be multiple things we're, we're doing. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a side-by-side -side migration, it could also be core augmentation, right? Could, is it fair to say that when you look at timing, when you look at the difficulty in converting a core, that sometimes, and you're not going to say it because you aren't going to blame the consumer, the customers in, as in the financial institution, but is it safe to say that in many cases, financial institutions get in their own way because they they hold on to some legacy things that make the real core less effective than it could have been? I think that's fair, but I don't. I don't want to blame the financial institutions for holding on to something, right? I think uh, because banking is such an important part of society, I think once we find something that works and is reliable and works well, that's something that we tend to hold on to and say, okay, we have something that's stable, working, solving customer problems. Let's not change it. And so I think uh, a lot of sort of holding on to the way things work is done because those are established patterns that have been established over decades. And, and it's, it's, it's hard to move away from them when they work so well. I think the challenge is when they start to not work so well. And that's when I think actually banks start to ask very openly, is this the right thing to do or is this not the right thing to do? So sure, are there patterns of using Gen 1 and Gen 2 cores that could probably increase their usefulness? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, the monolithic nature of those cores still means that you're sort of living in this two-speed IT world, trying to iterative, try to quickly iterate at the edge of your network while being held back by this core that's sort of that's monolithic and slow at the core of your network. And I think you know that worked for a little while, but at a certain point you start to say, hey, I've got to make changes in the core. I can't iterate quickly in the core. What if the core was part of my edge? What if I had a flat infrastructure, which is a more modern microservices-based infrastructure versus the old end-tier infrastructure where you sort of had back-end and front-end? And I think that is where banks start to say, hey, if I had that, we could do something really different and change the, change the, the, the pattern of product development to better match sort of what peers are doing in other areas of this industry and other industries 
versus versus sort of seeing an established pattern and saying it works, don't touch it. So, so David, I, I as I mentioned I was, last week, I was with a lot of bankers, probably five hundred bankers, and one of the questions that came up and one of the discussions that were had was, you know, many organizations are trying to re replace or modernize their course. Some are trying to modernize their modern mobile banking platform. Some are doing both. If you were to say the order of which it should be done, I, I I know what I think is logical, but the thing is, I'm not that person that knows the technology side very well. So if you were to mo need to do both, would you modernize your mobile banking platform first? Would you modernize your core first? Would you modernize them together? I don't think there's any way not to modernize them together. And I'll tell you why. It's because when, when we have the two-speed architecture as kind of the main way of enabling agility in, in banks and in, in infrastructure, it didn't work. I mean, it worked for a, a, a little a, a little while, right? You could do a certain amount at the edge of the network, but at a certain point, it's like you want to introduce a new product and you need a new way of calculating interest. You need a new event type. You need a new way of uh, creating a fee. I mean, all of these sorts of things that required uh, you helping settle customer accounts in a core required iterating the core. And that obviously held you back by the core's development sort of cadence. So I don't think there's a world where you can say, oh, we're just going to modernize the edge, but not modernize the core. I don't think there's a world where you just modernize the core and not the edge, because that's focusing on infrastructure. And I think if we focus on the customer and customer problems to solve, you're going to have to solve that customer pro that, that customer friction at every point from the front end customer experience all the way to the back end core. So I don't think I think thinking about this in terms of infrastructure modernization is a, a legacy framing. I think we should think about this in terms of speed of solving customer problems. What are those customer problems? And then how we line that up. I don't think any of this says I have to replace my whole core right away. I have to replace my whole you know, edge digital application right away. I think part of this is saying, what are the pieces along the, the supply chain uh, or rather the value chain really, right? Of how we serve our customers a given product. What are the pieces that I need to change? How can I change or enhance them in order to launch this new product or service? I think that's the, the better framing. And it gets, it gets us out of thinking about infrastructure and, fo and forces us to think about customers, customer friction, and really building a new value proposition. And that's really what we're seeing uh, with most of our customer interest today is the customers are saying, they, they of course they have a thousand problems but here are my top five problems yeah. and the core is a big part of it and we can certainly build a custom application a sidecar application a new customer journey that's the easier part but once it hits our back end everything gets frozen so how can you help me sort of modernize everything on my back end so that i can match sort of the speed of cloud native development that's happening in my application layer with with the back end core if that you, makes you, sense you, you mentioned the, the you mentioned the consumer in every every answer you've given me and that's good and you know, you need to know what your 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 North Star is going to be, what where you're going to get and how you have to get there. Yet we're talking about possibly splitting up these into into iterative and 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 composable solutions. How do you balance the need to do things that are manageable with the speed of customer change? Because the last thing you want to do is do it in a composable way that that maybe takes three years when the consumer's demands are changing almost daily. How do you balance those two against each other? Yeah, I think that's that that's that's the gig, right? I mean, if, if I think about like what it means to be in digital banking today, right? It's trying to figure out how do I take the intersection of rising customer demands around constant enhancements, customers complaining about things changing and not being able to understand intuitively how to use the bank. Uh, on one side, customers want a bank to disappear and only be there when they're needed. And on the other hand, they want the, the bank to be there for wherever they're needed in the customer's journey in a whole in, in, a, in a bunch of varying contexts. And so I think, you know, there's a few different rules that that banks have generally adopted that make sense. For instance, you don't you, when you introduce a new product, you don't completely change the whole landing page. Right. Or or. Uh, home screen of an application because that's that's very confusing. Uh, you do things like design and UX research and studies to make sure that when you do release something, it's intuitive and understandable by the customer. And uh, that's why we have sort of you know we have design practices and and UX practices and product management practices uh, because at the end of the day, it does get quite uh, quite conflicting where customers want a lot of iteration but also want stability and sort of to intuitively understand everything. And I think the banks that that are able to figure that out uh, do it brilliantly, and that's I think part of the 
that that study about uh, checking accounts that neobanks are, are really figuring it out. And that's because they're in this, this cloud native environment and cloud native mode. And so they're able to better mimic, you know, things like the social media company, I mean, companies. I mean, we expect sort of a new refresh of, you know, Instagram or whatever to happen on a biweekly basis. But we don't expect that. We, we sort of expect that from our banks and don't expect that. So when we see it, it's refreshing. It's great. It creates new engagement and uh, n- new uh, a new perception of the brand of the bank as being in tune with my needs and sort of building new experiences to help me on my journey. And so I think as we develop for customers in a customer-centric fashion, and this particularly is something that I see with the sort of new uh, SMB focus that we're seeing in the market, that uh, you know banks have, have recalled how much uh, S- SMBs are sort of underserved and really need the focus from us, and, and how many new applications and services uh, should be available to SMBs that aren't necessarily available. I think uh, when we think through that and sort of look at those experiences, I think the two ways of, of, of really creating an environment for users that makes sense to them is one, creating an application experience that builds trust and that's around stability and that's around, uh, again, iteratively developing but not completely changing things like the home experience and creating ways of navigating the application that are intuitive and all of that. And I think along with that trust comes really changing the brand of the bank to be more dynamic and focused on the customer. And so building the application stack where a customer kind of knows if they call customer service, if they use the the disputes, customer service functionality within the app, if they're talking to an intelligent digital assistant across all the channels that the the bank has a consistent and uh, stable approach to providing you the information you need when you need it. I think all those things together help build reliability and trust. And so, uh, changing things iteratively, but not massively on a regular basis allows for that balance. So an organization that's looking at converting their core has an existing core. We're not going from nothing to something. We're going right. from something to something. Those cores are usually with their core provider that they use for decades. I mean, or long, or longer, if you can look at it that way. The reality is at some point during this process, you could say they're double investing because it's not like the cost of the old core goes away immediately and you have to justify the new core. How can the business case be made to basically double down on modernization? How can banks measure the ROI on what's being done? And, you know, put another way, what are the costs of doing nothing and just waiting for your core provider to modernize their own systems? Yeah, so I think there's there's a few ways, right? The first is there's obviously the infrastructure cost. And if you're moving to a more modern hosted core, there's obviously a reduced TCO there that's usually fairly straightforward to manage. There's no more servers. There's no more knock necessarily. I mean, all of those things are, are alleviated. And so that TCO calculation is fairly straightforward. The second is uh, usually there are estimates for building new products and services. And so you can look at the average estimate for five services on the legacy infrastructure and what it would cost to build those services in the core. And typically those are specialized programmers as mentioned, right? COBOL and MUMPS and all these these uh, these languages that are not really modern uh, cloud-based languages that you don't have a ton of talent available for. What it costs to build those services in those contexts and then look at what it would cost to build more modern services uh, in a more modern application. And that gives you a, a fairly straightforward cost for uh, you know, for for production, cost of production, right, for your service. And then we can talk about sort of the cost benefit analysis in terms of velocity and say, my time to revenue is shrunk by quarters, my time to market is shrunk. What's the value in terms of customer churn and customer satisfaction? And what's the value in terms of being able to produce more and capture more business? And I think all of that is, I don't want to say straightforward because I realize banks are these uh, very large, complex businesses but certainly on a business line by business line uh, uh, perspective, each business line is already sort of looking at these metrics anyway, usually as a as good hygiene and a good way of figuring out which IT projects to invest in. So really lining those up, and that's something that we partner with, with customers on frequently and sort of helping them identify those first projects to use for migration, helping them understand their total cost of ownership. But, but we are looking at a huge divide. I mean, when I talked about, when we talked about the, the well, you mentioned the 10x TCO. I mean, I think that 
that's very real and becomes very obvious very quickly because we know how to manage infrastructure in the cloud uh, and we do that at scale every day and banks struggle with that. And so being able to do that for multiple banks uh, is our bread and butter and it's not necessarily something that the banks have to do anymore. So being able to alleviate that uh, from the banks is a significant cost saving as well. So it, it seems we, we talk on the fringe of things, we talk about customer experience, we talk about all these product line issues and all that. At the end of the day, the biggest threat to a financial institution today is not not satisfying your customer. It's messing up on the security side, messing up the fraud side and the risk issues. Let's talk a little bit about what the difference is between legacy systems and modernized cores opportunities out there today from a risk and fraud perspective. How much more secure is a financial institution with modern core technology as opposed to what is continually being fixed in the in the traditional legacy system? Yeah, uh, I love this question because it's something that I, I struggled with in the past as well. Because intuitively you would think uh, banks always wanted the most amount of control in order to ensure and and reliably uh, uh, reliably testify that they had the most amount of security possible, and that security in terms of reliability and resilience and uh, risk aversion and all of those sorts of principles, right? Uh, when it came to their infrastructure, and something really changed uh, with the advent of the cloud providers in the last ten years, which where where I think banks realized. You know the clouds. No, the cloud providers hire the best in breed of uh, and and leverage best in breed security practices, and they know a whole bunch about security and are able to do this at scale, and oftentimes better than the bank. So, for instance, a huge security risk is getting physical access to machines, and we all know that uh, the cloud providers are very good at, at at maintaining and reducing physical access to machines. Where, for instance, banks may have data centers that that you know don't offer. Uh, as great protection against physical access to the machines. Uh, things like geo redundancy, availability zones, and uh, and regions. You know, I, I've talked to several major banks that have multiple data centers, but they're all in the same uh, geographic region, which makes them uh, subject to some very specific risks. And and that that's sort of something that uh, the cloud providers have already architected around with uh, multi availability zone and multi region deployment patterns. And so what we're starting to see is that the cloud providers actually take a very sound scientific approach towards a lot of this. And the banks are able to sort of decide how much of that they want to they want to take and how much they don't want to take. And I know we're talking about the infrastructure, the infrastructure layer and resiliency, but of course, this also gets elevated to the risk level, where things like cloud level logging and auditing tend to be a lot better and a lot more fine-grained and a lot more, a lot less subject to uh to developer error then when developers have to do auditing and logging themselves of their own services, or they create their own bespoke horizontal services to do that, that may miss key events or may not write in certain scenarios and whatever else. So being able to leverage all these horizontal services from the cloud providers actually creates a whole bunch of value for banks because the banks, not, not only do they no longer have to build it, but they, they can rely on the services that many other financial institutions and other regulated institutions are using. And in that way, sort of understand that what they've got is actually better than what they had before. Well, you know, David, you, you said it all so well, because, you know, I look at the fact that you mentioned five, 10 years ago with the cloud introduction. I mean, for the first five years of cloud, everybody was more concerned about the security of the cloud more than their tech, their legacy system. They're saying, you know what, it's going outside the bank. It's all these other issues. And all of a sudden they started realizing that very much like, a piece of plastic versus a mobile phone as far as authentication for a, a credit card transaction, you go, you know what? Now it all makes sense. It's a whole lot safer the other way. But I think it's important to know too, and I, this is not my field of expertise, but if you're a new technologist, a new person coming out and working in the technology field, in the security field, which there's many, many, many people going in that field, they're not coming in to support legacy systems. They're out there trying to make the, the the cloud system stronger because that's where all the modern technology is. Just as importantly, and I think this is something we lose, is the ability to respond when something happens is easier in a cloud environment because 
as you said, more and more organizations are in it. 80% of what's in that system is the same for every organization, no matter how much people say our bank's different or our, funding, our credit union's different. The reality is 80% of it is exactly the same. So anything, any of things from a response basis is going to obviously be easier and faster in a cloud environment because that's where the thought leadership is today. I, I, it's hard to describe it any other way than the fact that, you know, when you've cobbled together a legacy system to fit a modern deliverable, you've done a whole lot of things behind the scenes that you couldn't retrace those footsteps if you wanted to. So you can do that in a you can do that in a cloud technology, can't you? So a hundred percent. And I also think there's a secondary effect there that we don't think about where there's a whole suite of tooling like pager duty, right? And outage management tooling and all these things that help with uh managing uh, resilience challenges. And they're all generally third-party services that have APIs and integrate with the cloud providers natively, uh, but are, ne are not necessarily integrated with bespoke and legacy bank infrastructure. And so being able to choose from all of that tooling and leverage all of that also helps with response times and escalations and sort of keeping the important people uh, in the know. And of course, uh, when it comes to customer notifications and all that, that, that's also tooling that exists off the shelf that banks can now leverage that they could never, that they couldn't leverage as easily in the past if they even could. So I think there's, there's secondary effects there also, which is there are ecosystems of tools that help create a richer environment to be able to make sure that um, IT professionals inside the bank can sort of manage and monitor that infrastructure and respond when there is a challenge. Business professionals inside the bank can be aware of those challenges and define what to do in terms of escalation, customer notification, uh, how to how to how to fail over and and and, and let's say invoke stand-in processing or active passive sort of uh, switching and all of that. I think uh, I think that whole ecosystem is uh, underappreciated and something that comes naturally when you're in the cloud and does not when you're in bespoke on-prem infrastructure. So that's worth worth noticing as well is that. Uh, the whole suite of management tooling around um, uh, operating, administering, and managing services is suddenly uh, interoperable and works out of the box. So for those that don't already have a modern core, right now, everybody's a shopper. Every, everybody's shopping for a, a core provider. And organizations have to figure out, where do I start in that process? Because I don't, I don't know what I don't know. And I... I tend to, as a banker, overcomplicate what the process is going to be. If for no other reason, then you, we forget. And this was said really well to me about a year ago, said, you got to remember that a quarter, about 80% of it is all the same. You have to really focus on the 20% that makes it different for your organization. So I'm looking for a new core provider. What should I be looking at when evaluating who I should partner with and where, you know, how do you begin that digitization, that digitization journey? Yeah, so I think as we've talked about, right, certainly looking at a Gen 3 provider uh, makes a lot of sense because I think it all comes down to, you know, and, and you've alluded this to, to this multiple times, right? How do you create an environment where bank developers thrive and bank developers can really move at speed and urgency to meet the needs of the business. I think that's key. It's something you're only gonna to get today with Gen 3 providers. And I think thinking about sort of what are the problems you're trying to solve and then how the Gen 3 providers can help, uh, you'll inevitably come to the, the conclusion that uh, we're the ideal uh, company to talk to, but but that that's the first thing I'd start start with, right? Which is to say, are you a provider that's going to create a modern environment for my developers uh, to be able to act with urgency and speed to meet the needs of the business? I think there's a few other things. I think figuring out how to evaluate a core provider as a partner and their experience in multiple markets across multiple products and their experience sort of working and understanding multiple domains where it's not necessarily just core banking, but other other areas of banking and payments, I think that's super important because uh, the more we look at the expectations of a bank today, the more we see sort of a cross-pollination and a blurring of the lines between sort of the payments world and the banking world and financial services and neobanks and embedded finance and all of that, where uh, banks are being forced to operate in all of those domains, compete in all those domains. And so finding a provider that can provide solutions in those domains is extremely important. And so I think yeah. finding, a sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, go, no, go ahead. You're good. And so finding like a, finding a partner that sort of understands the domains, understands what developers in a bank need, and then understands how to identify business problems and go solve them and get creative in that way and can sort of partner with you and work with you. I think that's key. That's that's key to how we work. And that's the way we we think about our banking partnerships. And so uh, you know, every time I, 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 we, every time we participate in RFP, I think about this. It's like, how do I express to this bank that this RFP is a very two-dimensional way of assessing our uh, technology on a spreadsheet? How do I say, but there's another dimension here, which is the partnership dimension, the human element, where it's sort of like, we've done this before, we know what we're doing, we operate in multiple domains. How can we share our best practices with you so that we're in sync and working in partnership and it's not just a vendor relationship? You, you you were saying the same thing I was going to ask because I think more than ever, when you're working with partners today, the good news is most of these partners know how to work with other partnerships you have in place. So that that's a key element that wasn't in place five years ago because we were all fighting each other. We're all trying to get into everything. And that doesn't work very well. And I think, you know, from my perspective and seeing organizations that have succeeded and ones that have lagged and I, I don't know of anybody myself that that has not been a success. It's just a matter of how quickly it's been. You know, you you said it very well. It gets down to trust. Who's going to be able to run down the field on your behalf, not with you? Because I, I, we tend to want to hold on to the ball at the same time. And if you, I'll use American football as an example. If you have two people running together trying to hold the football, it's not going to work very well. You're going to be slowed up. You've got to have trust in your provider. Say, I'm going to trust them to get to my destination on my behalf so that I can manage them and other components that are so important today because we don't have enough time. And if we have to be involved in every step of the process as opposed to relying on our partner to get us there in based on the knowledge they have, it's very important. And I think most importantly, nobody can be the best at everything. There was a time when your core provider could provide almost everything you ever wanted because it was a more simple world. You need, I think the one thing you maybe didn't mention, maybe you did mention is the one thing you have to look at is who's got a pulse on the future? Who's running three or four steps ahead of where you want to go so that they can get you there when you're ready to get there? Um, the consumer has been so amazing as far as what they expect. You know, they're putting together what the Netflix and Hulus of the world are doing, what the Ubers of the world are doing, what the Amazons of the world are doing what the Googles of the world are doing and what's going to happen in the whole generative AI space, that if you don't find a partner that's ready for those experiences, those engagements, that ability to move forward and their lives rely on it as well as yours, I think that's important, more important than ever, that to find those specialists that really, really, their business completely depends on making you happy, but it also depends on making everyone and their other customers happy. I, there was no question there. I apologize. Sometimes I'll do that. But I think the reality is, you know, at the end of the day, it's trust and trust to be able to deliver ahead of where you want to go. Um, yeah. So speaking of the future, when you're looking at generative AI and we're looking at APIs on a more, more legacy basis, how important is that when you're, when you're looking at a core modernization? When you're, because right now we're, we're already talking about cloud-based. But when you look at APIs, when you look at the ability to do a, you know, for me to be able to implement a buy now, pay later on a legacy platform, it's not really easy. But to do it on a on a on a on a modern core, you can do that. How do you look at what you need to do and what you have to be ready for in the Gen AI and the 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 power of APIs? So I, I definitely think that there's something to be said for the key part of delivering not just generative AI, right? But any sort of ML modeling in, in your organization is really getting a handle on your data and being able to model against that data, being able to deliver insights based on that data, uh, and whether it's being able to respond to real-time customer events or sort of do, uh, do some analysis across multiple channels or across a, a customer that uses multiple products to figure out what to offer them next. I think all of that relies on having your data in a place that's accessible, leverageable, and then of course, having an insertion point by which to deploy that model and offer it as a service. And so a lot of what we work on in core is, how do I get all of my data in a place where it's accessible and where we can make it not just available to developers and the customers, but help them by 
creating pre-built models to deliver services to them. So we have a payments risk platform, we have an ownership verification engine, we have a, an intelligent digital assistant, and all of that uses different types of, uh, of AI in order to deliver new value to customers. And I think we would never be able to get there if it weren't for uh, the way we've organized uh, access to data in the cloud. And so as we think about the core as a cloud service, being able to provide the data and expose the data to customers, both so they can do their own modeling. So our clients, our banking clients can do their own modeling, but also we can do modeling for them and deploy models that they can then leverage. I think that's a key point. And I think that's missed by a lot of the core providers because you know, core sort of went through, it originally started as something that looked a lot like a database. And then it ended up as something that looked a lot like a compute resource. And yeah. I think the, the real answer is that it's a it's a mix of both, right? Cores are complex and they're it's a mix of compute and database. And so uh, it's important not to over-index on either and to make sure that you have access to the data, can leverage that data, but of course are able to act on it as needed. And so figuring out that balance has been a big part of, of how we figure out what the core of the future looks like, because we know that cores are gonna be different in 10 years than they are today, right? I would I would imagine that Galileo has a has a little bit of an edge there in that you're already supporting a very modern um, organization in SoFi. And, and and so, you know, their demands alone make it so all your partners benefit from from what what the Derek's team is demanding of you. So it's it's kind of like that great balancing act. Um we have some questions from the from our our web participants today, our webinar participants. One of them is really, really good because I've been discussing it quite a bit lately. You know, a core conversion is not an IT project. It is an organizational process. And it's going to involve virtually everybody in the organization, either directly or indirectly. We're now in a, in a, in a time where anything that we change to a modern perspective puts in the mindset or the risk of, oh my gosh, am I going to be phased out because of this modernization? So you have some internal anxiety that you have to fight against. You have to do this every day. And, and, and I would imagine, because I see it when I visit financial institutions, you can tell very quickly in the room who really wishes you go away. But yeah. you, still need, you still need their partnership. And, the, and it's not that they're going to be vindictive. They're not, going to, they're not going to destroy the process. But the reality is they're not on board. How should an organization move forward in a, in a, in a uniform way, in a, in a complete organizational way, from the teleline, the customer service reps, all the way up to the, the executive offices and the board? How do you get everybody pulling the same way? Because the last thing you want is a tug of war between legacy and modernization, because we already see what that does in a branch versus non-branch environment. So how do you, how do, you do it in a, uh, a core conversion process? So I think there's there's a, uh, an organizational behavior component here that you're asking about, and and the other component you're asking about is 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 so what is the prescriptive advice that I would have in this situation? Yeah. I, I think the organizational behavior component is right and it's spot on. We see that all the time. People are the custodians of infrastructure. It's human. I mean, right. the reality is human. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 the truth is. It's human, but we talked about Conway's law and sort of how legacy infrastructure influenced the structure of the organizations today. And so we, I think we have this uh, concept uh, that still exists where people are sort of the custodians of infrastructure as, oppo as opposed to sort of the ownerships of services or have ownership over business problems that they help, help the business line solve. And so I think the shift there is around incentives. And I think there's a lot of conversation that goes on around KPIs or, or more modern form of that, which is uh, OKRs and how we can be aspirational about the problems that we're looking to solve for the business. I think a lot of that goes away when it's sort of, yeah, you used to own a fleet of 10,000 servers, but now instead you own all the services related to the following business. And how can we talk about organizing around that and modernizing that? I think the opportunity to be the champion around delivering new business value versus retiring uh, old infrastructure and saving costs, it's, it's, it enables you to be the more favorable side of the JAWS ratio where you're helping build the bank versus run the bank. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always a, a desirable place to be in the bank. So uh, what I've seen is that helping build the next generation of the bank, while initially some stakeholders might feel uneasy, if management does a good job of explaining how this is sort of the next iteration of, of the bank, 
and that the key stakeholders in the last iteration of the bank are going to be a key part of the next iteration, they feel a lot more of that uh, sort of uh, psychological safety around being able to push back and participate and sort of disintermediate themselves in their previous role because the custodian of infrastructure role is going away whether they like it or not. Uh, embracing the new empowerment uh, that management can provide them and the new set of responsibilities around sort of what are these new ways that we're going to unlock business and be responsible for opening up new revenue lines. Uh, that's a great place to be in a bank. It's a great place to be in any business and something that, that I think many IT professionals would desire. So in my experience, that's sort of the organizational behavior that I've seen where it's like, yeah. if management can shift that empowerment, then people jump on board because they immediately recognize that that's a, a better side of the jobs ratio to be in. I would agree. And, and, you know, it gets to communication. I mean, I'm sorry, the guy that, or woman that has managed a cold ball process who learned that from the beginning, is going to feel threatened. There's no way around it. However, you can communicate your way around that. If top management realizes we, they can't say like we used to say in the back the old days, hey, either get on the train or, or the, we leave the station without you. That's not really a great way to do it because these people come with amazing legacy thought leadership on things that have been broken in the past. And they'll say, by the way, just so you know, we fixed something that you may not even see that's not going to convert easily into the new modernized core. You need that. You need that legacy thought leadership. The last thing I want to do is for these core people, these people that have been around for a long time, to leave before the process starts because that serves nobody well. But again, it gets to communication. If it, People are frightened of being replaced. They're frightened because what you're doing is you're taking away what they were best at. But as you said, and I try to say it as often as possible, is transformation is pretty damn cool, no yeah. matter what age you are. I mean, I... I started my process of being a content provider 15 years ago now. It's amazing it's been that long. But that was to avoid becoming irrelevant. Not everybody has that mindset. I'm not going to say that's an easy mindset. However, if I had somebody to communicate, this is a good path to go, you're going to be okay. Don't avoid the conflicting conversations because it will not serve you well in the long term. Top, And it's got to be at the very top of the organization. Oh, and by the way, the top of the organization also have to feel comfortable with it because they're also being threatened by what is going to happen and what they give away in a clouded environment. What, and I call it give it away because that's legacy thought. But David, I cannot thank you any more than I already have for all the wisdom you bring to me. Anybody who knows me knows this is not my strong suit. You continually make me more wise and make me more aware of the questions I should ask. But it, um, it's it's great to get together with you. As I as we say usually at these points of the webinars, we will share what questions we did not get answered, and we'll give you the answers to those. You also receive a recording and a link to the recording to be able to share it with other people in your organization. David, I appreciate you and your whole organization for continually making us more wise and to move us forward in the whole spectrum of modernization. Jim, it's a privilege as always. Thank you. Thank you.